Cheers, everyone. It's another video. Tomorrow's actually my birthday, so by the time I get this posted, I'll probably already be 28 years old, but be sure to wish me a happy birthday in the comments. I love celebrating with y'all on the internet. But yeah, so today's video is just going to be going over all of my stats. So I have my mic... Hello, test, test. Very in the shot today. I'm gonna be going over all of my stats, GPA, a little bit of my resume, and my personal diversity statements that got me into schools like Columbia, Penn, UC Berkeley, uh, other schools. If you wanna see what schools I got into, you can watch the video above. To contextualize, I'm a re-applicant. So I did apply in 2021 and then reapplied in this 2022 cycle. Really, I'm just gonna focus on the materials that worked for me because 2021 was also the cursed year and so it just was not fun. <laughs> Please like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this content. Um, it's been super fun and uh, really great to connect with people and just post hopefully helpful things. Anyway, yeah, let's get into the video and not waste any time. So I'm going to start with just kind of like the scores, right? So LSAT GPA. Beginning with my LSAT, for context, I took the LSAT three times. I don't recommend doing that. If you want my LSAT tips, I have a video on that as well that you can pause this and go and watch that. My first score was ultimately a 162. It was not great for me. I had to go to the ER the night before my test and all this stuff, so I was very stressed out. I canceled that score. My score that I applied with in 2021 was a 167, and that score got me waitlisted essentially everywhere from Fordham to U Chicago. So one school that I was waitlisted at, it was uh, Emory. Emory offered to pay for me to retake my LSAT if I thought I could do better. So I did take my LSAT for a third time, and that's when I scored my 173. Um, which I used to apply in the 2022 cycle, which was a great improvement. I was PTing in the like low mid 170s, but you know, you never know. I was just happy if I scored one point higher. So to score six points higher, I was ecstatic. Um, and I think that was super, super helpful. So yeah, I took it three times, ultimately applied with 173. That's probably the most important information for the context of this video. Moving on to GPA. As I mentioned, I'm a non-traditional student. I'd been out of school for five years by the time I had applied. So my GPA was pretty set in stone. I wasn't worried about finals um, or things like that. I graduated as a double major in communications and religious studies um, from the honors program at my undergrad, which was just like a top 100, I don't even know if it's in the top 100, honestly. University is like a small liberal arts college. So I double majored and I got a 3.93, but LSAC's cumulative GPA was 3.95. I think that's because of the way that different schools scale their GPAs. I think I have one withdraw on there from like, uh, astronomy or something. I don't know. It wasn't a big deal, but there was ultimately nothing really crazy about my transcripts. I didn't have anything really intense to explain. I would say if you do have things on there that um, may be confusing to admissions to include an addendum, a uh, brief addendum. In my experience, it was just better to control the narrative as much as possible and leave them with as few questions about my application um, as I could. Okay, so we're gonna go over my resume. So some of this, the first part is gonna be academic and a little repetitive. Um, I'm gonna pull it up because I haven't looked at it in a minute. And I'll include like a screenshot or something somewhere as I'm talking about things. Um, uh, Gross. Take a little coffee break while we pull this up. Okay, so my resume is one page. I cut it down to one page. I've been working for five years. You know, I think unless you have like really, really, really substantial work experience and publications and all that stuff, go over a page then. I wouldn't say that this is the part to be creative in in your application. I would say that the law school admissions process, it's not really fun like the L Woods, like submit a video. <laughs> oh, hi. My name is L Woods. And for my admissions essay, I'm gonna tell all of you at Harvard why I'm gonna make an amazing lawyer. They just want you to submit what they've asked for and just follow the directions. So my resume, it starts off, I have my education at the top because, you know, law school is an academic professional program. So I start off with that. It just has where I went to school, my majors, when I graduated, that I was in the honors program. I included both my thesis and my capstone at the top. And then I included a few activities, but I only included the ones that really fit my narrative of my application. And then I included a study abroad for one semester, which ultimately I don't think was that important, but could be nice. I don't know. And then moving on from there, I went into honors and awards. It's just very brief. I didn't list out like what each award and honor was. I did include honor societies here. I did receive two departmental awards, so I included those and that was that. And then we get into employment. So this is probably one of the most important parts for me, just because it's 
you know, my most recent work experience. But for you, it could be internships. It could be positions you held in undergrad, depending on your situation. It's honestly just formatted from like most recent to oldest. I will say one of the most important things because my experience is in marketing and it's not law related. I kept everything very simple. I didn't use terms that are within my industries. I use things that people would understand. And then I also made sure to use words like negotiate, manage, implemented, like actionable words that also feel like they would fit well in the law school sphere. I wouldn't say don't be cliche about it, but like keep it simple make it make sense for what you're applying for. And then I included a few things from undergrad because they fit with my narrative. And then at the bottom, I included philanthropy just because that's important to me and I think volunteer work matters. And pro bono is a large part of why I wanna go into law. Yeah, and that's my resume. So pretty simple, nothing crazy, honestly. I don't, I don't have like, internships with senators or like, you know, I don't have anything really wild on this. I think I just was consistent and, um, showed that I care. So, I mean, it's my life. This is this is the work experience I have, so that's what I put. Anyway, okay, moving on. So I did want to touch on um, being non-traditional and a re-applicant before I get into my personal statement, diversity statement. So for me in the non-traditional aspect, you could see it throughout my application because I realized later I wanted to go into law school. So my why um, was very clear to me and I wanted to make it very clear to admissions. Like, why am I leaving this career and successful career in marketing and video games to go into law school because I think that's a question admissions would have like you know why would you leave something that you've worked for for years and um, seems to be going well based on your resume I was like very explicit in why I included that you know for me it has to do with systemic change and structural changes like marketing just does not allow me to do the work whether that's diversity equity and inclusion work or you know LGBT rights like those sorts of things I just cannot do in the way I want to and then re-applicant so a lot of people ask me why I chose to wait and reapply I think my situation is a little unique because like I said, it was the middle of the panini, it was awful. And you know, I was waitlisted at such a range of schools, like top three schools to top 30 schools. And I think a lot of that did have to do with timing. I didn't apply until February just because of how my LSATs worked out. And like I said, I went to the ER, so it is what it is. I wanted to apply earlier, but that's just not how the cards fell for me. I think if you're asking yourself if you should retake your LSAT and reapply, if you know you've been scoring higher in your practice test than you did on your LSAT, I think it's fine to retake. And for me, it was an investment of time versus money. I chose to retake knowing that if I invested the time, it would probably pay off and it did for me. So, you know, not just admissions wise, but also scholarship wise, like I chose to invest that time to save um, work labor time on the back end post grad. Yeah, so I mean, if that's a situation you're in, I can't promise you it'll go well or like as well as it did for me. Um, you kind of have to make your own decision. Now we're going to get into my personal statement and diversity statement. If I leave anything out or mute it, it's just for like security or like comfort, right? I wrote these knowing admissions would read them and I felt comfortable talking to them, but I didn't necessarily write them for the internet. But because people have asked, I'm fine sharing. You know, these got me into great schools. I honestly think my personal statement carried a lot and my letters of rec. Honestly, that's not something I'm talking about in this video, but like I'd say really put some work into your letters of rec and reach out to people who know you. Um, yeah, we'll just get into it. But anyway, so like this is the one I sent to Columbia, Penn, Berkeley. I didn't change it for anyone really. I'm going to be reading off the screen. So here we go. At a towering 6'4", with my toes cramping inside of 4-inch stiletto heels and strands of hair from my 30-inch long wig sticking to my caked-on makeup, I stomp as quickly as possible across campus in the bright afternoon sun. I head towards the room where my peers, professors, and parents await to attend the first-ever research presentation done in drag at my conservative Catholic university. Presenting my honors thesis in drag not only provided a fantastic visual aid to my audience for understanding my research, but also served to openly align myself with the drag queens and trans women of color who have been a driving force for queer liberation for decades. In using my presentation to highlight queer excellence on campus, I was demanding that one of the highest levels of academic achievement possible at my university be irrefutably linked with my queer identity. It was my own personal stone wall memorialized through the publication of my thesis in our university library upon completion. Many times, queer people are included at the decision-making table only upon invitation from heterosexual, cisgender individuals who accept or tolerate our presence. My honors thesis is where I stopped waiting for an invitation and began claiming... Sp <laughs> Sorry, reading, like, stresses me out. Okay. <laughs> my honors thesis is where I stopped waiting for an invitation and began claiming space for myself, my perspective, and my community. Contributing a positive legacy for the queer community and creating a future 
and creating future opportunities for LGBTQ members gave me purpose at a university that has a rocky relationship with a more visible LGBTQ plus presence. Protests have occurred from students and alumni groups since the inception of the student drag show in 2012, and a website run by prominent alumni shares hateful opinions and shames LGBTQ plus students, faculty, and initiatives. Upon graduating, it was imperative that my career aligned with my goals to continue improving the lives of LGBTQ plus individuals and other marginalized groups in tangible ways. I began working in a marketing agency representing the FDA on two national public health campaigns that educated and motivated LGBTQ plus young adults and multicultural teens to live a tobacco-free life. I now work for a top North American video gamer to create innovative campaigns and advocate for gender equity in a new and growing industry. One of the initiatives I'm proudest of while working in gaming was facilitating meetings for an all-women professional esports team to get drafted by a major organization. My goal was to create a partnership that had a systemic impact and provided the team with financial resources, exposure, and industry-wide support. The women of the team and I found a top-tier organization that wanted to sign them as professional players, a huge step forward for our industry, which is often referred to as a boys club. And then we received the 30-page contract in our email inbox. I was suddenly stuck. I knew I did not have the skills necessary to adequately, adequately assist the team beyond that point. That experience made clear to me that, although I excel in marketing, to create the type of systemic change I wish to see in gaming and beyond, earning a JD would be necessary. My time in gaming has also coincided with record-breaking increases in anti-trans legislation and the 2021 Olympics, which further highlighted the inequity and exploitation of black women across the globe. Although progress was made from the women's esports team getting signed to a better contract, discrimination continues to increase, further solidifying my decision to pivot from marketing and pursue a JD to empower communities that have been targets of discrimination. In making the serious decision to leave my job, where I found much success and reapply to law school, I invested a significant amount of time, effort, and resources. Since applying last year, I've retaken the LSAT and proud to have earned a score that is more representative of my abilities as a student. I have also continued my work advocating for gender equity in gaming by producing a podcast with iHeartMedia, hiring a diverse hosting cast, and providing them a platform to amplify their experiences within the industry. Furthermore, as a first-generation professional student, I was able to use the additional time to connect with current law students, professors, and lawyers to gain an insider's perspective. I spoke with a law professor who said, the law touches every part of society, so if you'd like to make a change within society, becoming a lawyer, a lawyer is the vehicle on which you can have an impact. In line with my honors thesis, I'm ready to step up to push my community forward. My goal is not simply increased representation, but to obtain the highest caliber education possible as a queer individual and provide all of my clients with the highest quality legal counsel. I am eager to be a vehicle of change for LGBTQ plus individuals and advocate for other communities who are currently underrepresented by the law. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, I wrote that a long time ago. It feels weird to read it. It hits on a lot of different things, right? In two pages. So that's two pages double-spaced. So I really tried to communicate being first gen, being queer, being um, a reapplicant. So those are all things I hit on. I start off by really talking about my educational background because this is an academic institution, right? So speaking about my honors thesis, the motivations behind my honors thesis, and also why that still aligns with my ethic and my like ethos of how I approach the world, I thought was a great way to start and was a compelling way to get the reader interested. And then moving into the like, what have I done since school very briefly, because I don't think that's as important, but I thought it was helpful to contextualize how I chose to pivot from marketing into law. And then further contextualizing with the work I'd done, since I am a reapplicant, I thought it was important to make sure I touched on what I've been doing in this last year, um, that I haven't been stagnant, that I worked to prepare myself for law school and also I've been doing stuff um, within my field and my industry still and trying to make positive change. So that's my personal statement. So take it or leave it. Um, sorry, I like cannot read off a screen. <laughs> but yeah, we'll get in my diversity statement. So this one is a little different. So my diversity statement was not the same for every school and I didn't send it to every school. And honestly, in retrospect, I wish I hadn't sent it to Yale. I know that they're like very like keep it short. I personally included it because I think I talk a lot about being queer um, and that side of my application, but I don't really touch on my like religious studies major at all. I'm glad I included it. I still think it's well written and provide something new, but if you don't have anything new to say in your application, it's fine to leave it out. This is one page, double space, like kept it brief. Take it or leave it. I chose to include it. My results were my results. I'm very happy with them. I'll just read it and whatever. Upon graduating high school, I took a gap year and enrolled in a religious discipleship program dedicated to intense Christian practice, biblical study, and missionary service. The program required us to abstain from dating, watching television and movies, playing video games, and listening to non-worship music for the entire year. 
It was within this very constrained setting that I realized I was gay. I completed the program with an extensive knowledge of the Christian faith, but also an identity crisis. How could I, as a person of faith, preach honesty and human flourishing when I was withholding those from myself? As I began a dual degree studying communications and religious studies at a Catholic university, I felt suffocated navigating between my faith and sexual orientation. My initial solution was to stay in the closet, but after years of introspection, I publicly came out as gay the fall of my junior year. So kind of like... <laughs> Coming out led to a pride in my identity I'd never felt before. Being an open, being the only openly gay student in my religious studies program inspired me to understand how queer communities and faith interacted. I diversified my studies beyond my initial focus of Christian theology and researched the rich religious practices of queer and marginalized groups who served as pillars in their communities. I found I didn't need to reject either part of myself and there could be a unification of my queer and spiritual sides. The journey of claiming my queer identity and no longer de denouncing it as my cross to bear provided me with a nuanced and critical perspective I would not have found in the closet. Through addressing my own complex identities, I was introduced to intersectionality and how power structures impact people differently depending on the several identities someone may hold. The extreme pressure I endured while coming out in a hyper-religious setting has provided me with the tenacity to find creative solutions to complex issues because I'm not intimidated by multifaceted problems. In addition, through claiming the honesty and human flourishing I'd been denying myself, I am better able to empathize with others and understand people who are different from me. I no longer condemn my queer identity or faith, but celebrate the foundations they provided me in valuing diversity and positioning honesty at the core of my ethics. My identities as a spiritual and queer person have brought in my definition of human flourishing and authenticity, and I desire that freedom for others. So like I said, I wanted to really like lean into my background. I'm not as religious anymore, but I was like very religious in my like young adult, like coming of age time, right? Like, so it was a very formative time for me. And I do think you can see that in my transcripts. So that is one thing I thought would be interesting to touch on. There's a very clear point after coming out my transcript where a lot of my religion classes become much more diverse. I was taking like Pauline theology and like biblical studies and um, those types of things like freshman and sophomore year. And then junior and senior year, I was taking things like the problem with God and homosexuality and Christianity and Buddhism and like all these different types of things. Um, and so it really opened me up to just so many different perspectives. And I think those things are very valuable to me and they're very central to how I approach the world. You know, take it for what you will. Um, this has been very like vulnerable for me and sharing this type of stuff can be very uncomfortable. <laughs> but you know, there it is. Hopefully this is helpful. Hopefully, especially for other queer people or marginalized people, um, you know, my results were great. Hopefully your results are even better. And I hope that we just continue to excel and be great lawyers who have positive impact on the world. Thanks for watching. If you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, give this video a thumbs up. It really helps the channel and subscribe. I would love it. And I look forward to posting more videos. I'll be moving and talking about scholarships and all these different things. Um, if you want to know where I'm going to school, that video is up and it's very corny and super funny. Yeah, and then happy birthday to me. That's how I'm going to end this video because now I'm going to be 28 tomorrow. So what a time. You know, <laughs> what a time. Um, thanks again. I appreciate you. Have a good day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.